So, as was pointed out in the introduction, um, I've had this interest for some while. Initially, it started out with the United States. Um, little things like reading the Columbus Dispatch <laughs> and wondering why the obsession about development, right? You know, the, the um, space that's given to proposals for new residential developments or for landing some firm that's going to come into the Columbus area and supposedly bring a lot of jobs. Uh, or the closure of a shopping center, or the opening of a new shopping center, or this thing that's going on north of Franklin County now, uh, this uh, outlet mall that's being planned. Right, so th this, this, relatively speaking, it consumes a huge amount of um, space, and not just the Columbus Dispatch, but any, any newspaper in the United States. And maybe that's part of it, that newspapers in the United States are regional, right? They're not. You don't have a national press, right? So in Europe, people don't take the equivalent of the Columbus Dispatch. They take the Daily Express, heaven forbid, what I was brought up with, or they, or they take something like Le Monde or Die Welt, whatever, right? Um, so I was originally interested in uh, in the United States, and coming from uh, Western Europe, I began to see, uh, you know, as one does. It's a great education, going and living in another country. You begin to see these contrasts. You begin to wonder why. Um, so eventually, I came around to the, uh, the, the idea that the, the policy in the United States and the subsequent politics, too, is very, very different. Um, so in the United States, uh, policy is highly decentralized. <clears throat> Every state has a Department of, e of, Department of Development. Right? And it's, it's post-war which is interesting in itself. Um, local governments, development is a major concern. Um, development in terms, particularly of uh, bringing in uh, new investment, right? Competing for new investment, typically from outside. Right? So attracting a new investment, stuff that is going to add to the economic base, right? So the economic base, you guys are in a public policy unit. It might be something that you've heard of. Um, something that's going to generate exports for the locality, or if it's the state, for the state. But the federal government tended to be not, not very proactive, much more reactive, right? So the federal government gets this, these demands from local government, or rather from Congressional people, senators, goes through the appropriate committees, gets tagged on as an amendment, and lo and behold, Columbus gets something. <laughs> okay? That's local economic development. Come back to that. Uh, so, highly decentralized, uh, very distinctive uh, set of practices, competition, come and build your factory here. Uh, we have all these advantages. We have an attractive business climate, right? So business climate is a key idea in local economic development practice in the United States. Um, what it means, it means things, oh, I'll show you what it means in a minute. Uh, and we will offer you incentives. We'll offer you, I'm trying to think of this wonderful advert I once saw from Amarillo of all places where they would <laughs> pay you so much money for every job you brought to Amarillo. <laughs> and they were going to pay you a lot of money. Yeah. Um, this is an old book, but it does capture something of the American uh, local economic development scene. Um, last entrepreneurs being local governments and states and departments of development. Um, and that reminds me, uh, you know, as far as local government is concerned, uh, planners. So planners in the United States tend to be very subordinate to the local economic development agenda. A uh, little uh, story, I think, this, uh, I think this has changed again, but there was a time in Columbus, they renamed the city planning department 
the jobs department. <laughs> Very interesting, the jobs department, right? Exhibiting their subordination to the local economic development agenda. Uh, this is the sort of uh, publicity you get. This is obviously state publicity, the New, New York works. Uh, so they're clearly drawing a contrast with the old New York. <laughs> Uh, this is Indiana, ranked number one state by manufacturing matters, it's a, Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? This is San Diego, and you may have seen this sort of stuff before. All right, so business climate. You know, what sort of things are being flaunted? You know, how are states being ranked? Right? So they're being ranked partly in terms of Taxation levels, particularly taxation on business, taxation on inventories. Um, so, you know, the details are not important. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that's used in the competition room with inward investment. Uh, site selections, 2007, top state business climate rankings. All right, well, you see that <laughs> Ohio is number seven, right? So the details are actually slightly amusing here, right? Should Ohio take pride in being so high in these business rankings? Well, take a look at the company it's keeping. I'm not sure about it. Right. Okay, what's that? Anybody know? What are the states in red? It's, it's, a, it's something that will be used when economic development people start talking about business climate. Anybody? So it's right to work laws. All right, so right to work. <laughs> and the discourse is wonderful, isn't it? Right, right to work. <laughs> well, why should anybody be opposed to right to work? What it means is we're going to put limits on organizing. We're going to make it hard for you guys to organize yourselves into labor unions. And that's what it means. And you can see how the manufacturing belt uh, is, and the West Coast, right? They typically abstain from this sort of stuff. Michigan is very recent, right? So Michigan is now a right-to-work state. <coughs> there we go again. So there are, you know, this is, this is indicative of the sociology of local economic development, right? The, the world of the economic development professionals. So they have these, these magazines. Um, they also have their consultants. Do you know this is... <laughs> He used to be on the faculty here at Ohio State. It's Richard Florida. You know, Richard Florida, he used to be in planning. I liked Richard. I really did. <laughs> but <he's laughs> you have to hear him speak. You, you don't like him after you <laughs> heard him speak. <laughs> uh, so Richard uh, made, a lot of, uh, made a big name for himself, made a lot of money with this book, The Rise of the Creative Class. It's, it's, it's about how you know, how localities can grow, right? So how do they grow? They attract the creative class. Now, you have to read it to find out what the creative class is. So Richard, uh, now, he's a consultant, and right? he makes a lot of money. Uh, I mean, literally. I mean, you wouldn't believe. Um, and he's not alone. So this is the world of local economic development. Um, a very distinctive, a distinctively American world. Uh, so we're talking about the, I was talking about the practices through which local economic development policy is conducted. Um, you know, in my opening remarks, I, I made a comment about getting a federal government to do things. All right, so this is a very sort of bottom-up operation. Local economic development, very bottom-up. Federal government comes into it but more in a sort of reactive role. You understand? More reactive. Federal government has lots of money. It has the progressive income tax. So it's a much more effective taxing agent than the states are. Um, it also has regulatory power that you can turn to your advantage. It has money for things like irrigation works. Right? So, you know, the Congress people from Arizona, they're always sniffing around the federal government. All right, for more money for irrigation. Uh, again, the American local economic development scene, 
Growth coalitions, very important, right? Um, this is where the real impetus comes from, from lo for local economic development. It's a very private impetus. All right, local government participates. Local government will find its own reasons for, for participating, but the real thrust comes from business, uh, play a central role in drawing and soliciting firms to come and locate here in uh, central Ohio. Uh, the utilities are hugely important in this, hugely. Right? So the, every electric and gas utility has an economic development department. It does. Right? If a firm wants to come and locate, if an industrial firm, sorry, if an industrial firm wants to come and locate in central Ohio, they're the first port of call. That's where they go to first. Right? They go to the utilities because the utilities have the information on the sites. Right? So the utilities are important. Uh, locally owned and operated newspapers are important. Right? Be you know, because they want the advertising. They want to see the, they want to see the local economy grow. Right? It'll be more advertising. It'll be more readers. So there are fewer and fewer of those. Uh, Columbus Dispatch is a classic case. Right? Um, and the Columbus Dispatch has gotten very involved in real estate. And its investments are purely in the Columbus area. It wants the Columbus area to grow. Right? So newspapers, media empires. So the, the Dispatch is a media empire. Right? It's not just newspapers. There's also TV and radio. It used to be a bank, too. There used to be something called the Ohio Bank, which was owned by the Dispatch. Um, and developers. Right? So de many developers are very local in their orientation. They need, you know, they've got their ear to the ground. Uh, they need to be clued into what's going on in a particular market. So they'll be important participants in this stuff. And the consultants, uh, we talked about Richard, but he's not alone. A um, number of others. Uh, also location, uh, I mean, this is, these guys, they don't go around giving speeches. They're hired by companies like Ford, Right, or GE, to find a site. Right, so two of the well-known ones, Fantas, Real Estate Research Corporation. They're both in Chicago for some odd reason. I, d I don't understand that, but they are. So you've got these site consultants, location consulting. Right. Again, part of the world of local economic development. Okay, West European contrast. Um, yeah, so there's an emphasis on what I'm calling the good geography, uh, and this has meant several different things, right? It, it's meant putting jobs where the unemployed are, as we'll see. It's, it's meant historically, right? It's tended to shift more recently. Historically, it's meant putting jobs where the unemployed are. It's meant decentralizing. Uh, it's meant the compact city. I mean, it's sort of very sort of Heinz 57 varieties sort of stuff, right? Um, New towns, compact cities, regional redistribution by the welfare state. You know, so unemployment goes up in a region. Right, so as taxes go down. You know, unemployed people don't pay taxes. But payments, expenditures, unemployment compensation and that sort of stuff, that increases. So that sort of buffers the poorer areas, the areas that are down on their luck against hard times. At the same time, it limits the expansion in the growth areas. It limits the inflationary pressures. All right, so you, you, you'll say, well, the United States has a welfare state. Too. Yeah, it does, but it's mainly 50 of them. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a highly fragmented welfare state here in the United States. It doesn't function quite as effectively as, as these arrangements. Um, so in France, uh, they had a policy. I'm not sure it operates anymore, but they had a policy uh, of decentralizing from Paris. Paris, you know, France is highly centralized, a highly centralized country. So they had a policy of investing in infrastructure in these larger provincial metropoles, right, or, or actually groups of cities down here, right? So Aix-en-Provence and Marseille. Right? Just as an example of the decentralizing impulse that has occurred in Western Europe, particularly since the war, New towns around Paris. Right, so I don't know why they're portrayed like this, but they are, so like coffins. Um, this one, incidentally, uh, is where uh, 
Euro Disney is located. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you take the, uh, the uh, high-speed train from uh, the airport in Paris, if you go south, <laughs> it actually stops there. It has its own <laughs> stop. <laughs> right, Disney, essentially, Euro Disney has its own stop on this high-speed rail network. Quite extraordinary. I mean, the French bent over backwards in order to get this thing, right? And that's, that's more recent. You know, that sort of change where you're competing for these things, I'll come back to that. Uh, these are the new towns in Britain. Notice that they're around the major cities, right? So Birmingham and London, right? So they cluster around the major cities. Here's Manchester. Here's Newcastle up here. Okay? So decentralization, new towns, entirely new towns. Not expanded ones, but new towns. Um, this was a policy, it still exists to some degree, of persuading firms to uh, establish branch plans in areas of relatively high unemployment. Right? So in other words, localities weren't competing as they would have done over here. They weren't competing for these plans. The, go the central government was saying, we want you to go there and we'll pay you. <laughs> so, so the payments were coming from central government. They weren't coming from local or state government, as in the United States. Uh, Germany had similar policies. Uh, Italy, France, uh, Sweden. So putting the jobs where the, uh, the jobless are. Right? And this worked. This worked pretty well until the early 70s. Right? It worked because the economies were expanding. Employment was expanding. Right, so you could put factories in the development areas. It wasn't going to have a serious impact on employment down here because right, the, the economies were much more buoyant then. Um, all right, compact city. Look, this, this is Tyne and Weir, right? It says Newcastle. This urban area is about a million people. It has its own light rail transit. It's actually a, a subway in parts. It's underground. Right? Uh, and notice, it's connecting out at the airport, and it connects with the main, the main train station. Right? So this is part of what I mean when I talk about trying to create a good geography. This will have been done with mainly central government money. Um, admittedly, they're making use, to a very high degree, of disused rail lines. Old, old rail lines that are no longer used for any other purpose. This is uh, Munich, um, much more elaborate. Munich is, well, here, here's the amazing thing. Munich is about the size of the Columbus metropolitan area. <laughs> um, connecting with the uh, major station. Uh, these two actually, I haven't been able to work out how, but they are connected to the airport. Uh, so, in Europe, policy historically has been very centralized. It still is. Industrial location, planning. Planning. Until very recently. Right? The way planning for housing worked in Britain. Okay? <laughs> you might have trouble believing this. Uh, based on your American experience. Um, the British government would draw up projected demand for housing in different regions. So there are about eight or nine regions. Said, right, there are going to be so many new housing units in southwest England. <laughs> right? There has to be. Now you guys fight it out and decide where those houses are going to be. Right? So this was a central government directive. Right, the idea was that the housing should be where the demand is. Right, that, that has recently been uh, scrapped. But it existed for many years. And I, I mention it because the important role that the central coordination of land use planning plays, not just in Britain, but in European countries as a whole. Right. Okay, here, I mean, by way of contrast, you know, if the... If the um, if city council uh, says, all right, you know, we're going to follow whatever, we're going to allow this rezoning, 
Right? The, the only recourse you have is through a local referendum. In Europe, it would be to the central government. You'd say, well, we think you should come and look at this. This is a matter of national interest. Uh, you, we think this decision should be reconsidered. It's always a national interest, I think. Of recent changes, so I mentioned uh, the Disney, uh, Euro Disney. Uh, that was uh, quite intensely contested. Uh, it could have gone to Spain. No? You, you know, what you're getting in Europe now what, uh, is the individual, all right, so Europe, we're talking mainly about the EU. The member countries of the EU are operating more and more like American states. I mean, don't take that too far, but there is that tendency. And they are competing for things like the, uh, you know, just like Ohio and Kentucky will compete for a Japanese car plant. It's the same between Britain and France. Right? And Euro Disney was another one. Sorry, yeah, Euro Disney. That was another example. Um, so you're beginning to get a, a bit more territorial competition creeping in, in the European case. Um, and that has also been, uh, you know, I think, I think it's been strengthened by the, the way in which the East European countries are now part of it. So the East European countries, low, you know, it's like Mexico is the United States, right? So Romania and Slovakia to Germany, right? So, you know, the French and the uh, German auto companies, they're putting their assembly plants in Eastern Europe. That, is, that has heightened the tensions. It's heightened the territorial tensions. So they're much more like what you get between the states here in the United States. All right? So contrast, just in summary of what I've been saying. So this bottom one. This is the growth coalition element. But in Europe, growth coalitions tend to be very weak. And the, and the state, the relationship of the state to business, the state has more power than it does in the United States. You don't have the same suspicion of the state as you do over here. Right? So this, the state is sort of regarded with some skepticism. Now I, I'll come back to that very briefly in a minute. Um, more skepticism than it is uh, in Europe. Okay. So we've got these contrasts. How are we going to explain them? So I've got three possibilities here. By the way, uh, while I think about it, um, I was asked if I had any reading for you. This, this is based on a book manuscript. Um, this part, I, if anybody's interested, just let me know. And uh, there's a chapter on this, uh, just explaining. So this, this is the uh, this is a more analytic part. Um, state form. And by state form, I don't just mean the internal organisation of the state. Um, I'm not ref just referring to things like elections, I'm also referring to the relationship between the state and the rest of society, the boundary between the state and the rest of society. And that's important for this case. Class relations, national discord. Okay, so state structure. Um, the institutional form of the American state, the American state is incredibly fragmented. It really is. Right? You know, it's this, uh, the checks and balances stuff that you're familiar with. Um, it's the um, federal thing. You know, the United States is radically federal. And then, I mean, just, it must be the most radical federation in the world in terms of what's uh, decentralized. Um, and then what have the states done? <laughs> They've delegated a lot of this power to local governments. Right? You know, power to raise money. Uh, a lot of powers that are actually very relevant to local economic development. Right? Powers over... Land use planning, right? No appeal to the state. The state is hands off. You guys do it, right? We're not interested. You should be interested. Um, 
public works, right? The whole municipal bond thing, right? Raising money for public works. Nothing like that in Western Europe. No bond market, right? Local governments have that power. Uh, they have the power to offer incentives. Um, local governments have the power to offer incentives in Britain, but if they do, they have to... Uh, <laughs> They have to pay the central government the money that the central... I don't know how it works, but they're penalised for it. <laughs> right? They're penalised. So, you know, you know, getting back to the, you know, the, the radically uh, federal form, well, I, I, I talked about uh, right to work. Right? I mean, this is used in local economic development. This becomes part of business climate. You know, Without, without this uh, decentralization responsibility, the idea of business client makes no sense. It makes no sense. You couldn't use it unless you had this radical federalism with respect to state taxation, and particularly state regulation with respect to things like um, the, the relationship, the employment relation between employers and workers. Uh, so it has a, a very strong territorial expression. Um, State and civil society are very different balance, as you know. Uh, you know, it's... You look at the, uh, the comparative figures for welfare states. Uh, you look at how much money is uh, so-called social expenditure. I've, I've got a table in the chapter, if you want to see it. Uh, you th you th one thinks of things like uh, health, public health, um, and what's so interesting, and, and you think of public housing, what's so interesting is, beyond that, when you start to look at the details of how these things are provided, once they get provided, once they get provided, like, uh, you know, the much derided Obamacare, you look, you look at how they're provided, and lo and behold... <laughs> you know, business plays an important role, right? So the, the private insurers are there, right? <laughs> astounding. I mean, to me it's astounding, right? Um, public housing has been dismantled in favor of what? A program for landlords, right? Section 8, right? Section 8 is, uh, you know, you get take these housing vouchers and, uh, you know, you find a landlord who's willing to rent to you. I mean, all I'm saying is there's a different balance between the state and business, right? So business has penetrated the state here in the United States to a degree that it's, it's foreign to the West European experience. All right, the question of class, um, class relations, how they might factor into this. I think it's fairly easy to see how the state factors into these differences, right? the differences in local economic development. Um, Okay, so the, you know, Europe, well, I mean, the, <laughs> uh, the, the classic, uh, or a, cl yeah, a classic image that's used by uh, politicians um, when talking about policy in the United States, right, they, they'll sometimes compare it with Europe and how such and such a policy is socialist, right? So socialist is a bad word in the United States. It is, right? <laughs> you don't have to take it too seriously. Um, well, in Europe, you know, you've got parties that say, we're socialist. <laughs> so, the, you know, the second most important party in Britain at the moment, in terms of its... Yeah, it's the British Labour Party. They, they'd say they're socialists. They're actually not, but they'd say they're socialists and they'd say it with pride, right? Likewise in France, the Socialist Party, right? Um, what was it? Uh, Hollande, right? <laughs> um, Social Democrats in Germany, right? Uh, France used to have a pretty strong Communist Party. You know, it would poll about 20% of the votes uh, until probably about 20 years ago. Started to decline. Um, so the political representation of the working class has always been much stronger in Western Europe. Right? Um, 
And there's something else that's peculiar about the United States compared with Western Europe. The Republicans are very different from the right wing in Europe, right? And, and in fact, this, this re uh, relates to what I'm calling one nationism. Um, look, property and business. doesn't matter whether it's the United States or, you, or France or Germany. It always is. It's the party of low taxes. Uh, it's the party of private property, whether it's productive or consumptive, as in home ownership. Uh, it's the party that wants to rein in the labor unions. Right? So it's a very common pattern. Right? That means that they can't possibly win <laughs> unless they appeal to the working class in some way. How do you appeal to the working class? Right? So what you engage in is some form of what I call one-nationism. Right? You know, we all share these things. Right? This is something that applies to us all. Um, so in Europe, uh, one nationism has taken a very strong welfareism form, right? So we're going to look after you. Right? I mean, <laughs> uh, we're going to look after the poor, right? So welfare has a stronger sort of positive resonance in Western Europe. In the United States, the way one nationism has worked is that, uh, hey, you can do it. Right? Everybody can rise up. It's the Horatio Alger type stuff. It's the um, <laughs> Horatio Alger stories, you know, where uh, poor people triumph, right? <laughs> right? Uh, you know, they rise up, they get, become wealthy. Oh, you, you know, I think every candidate for, for president in the United States has to have and will use a Horatio Alger story. Right? How they used to work on the assembly line. Yes, they did, but Daddy owned the factory, and it was part of the probation period. <laughs> but they all have that story about how they rose up.